Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's raining out, right? My, my office is in the basement, so I think it's raining. So thank you for coming on a, on a rainy evening. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all. Before we get started, I'd just ask that we all make sure our cell phones are turned to mute, please. And it's my pleasure to, to welcome our speaker tonight, Janice Katz, um, from the Art Institute of Chicago, where she serves as the Roger L. Weston Curator of Japanese Art. She has a degree from Northwestern, a PhD from Princeton, and her research is focused, among other things, on paintings of the Edo period um, and the history of art collecting in Japan as well. Uh, numerous publications to her credit. And my, I was just telling her, my, my secret agenda in having her come tonight is to talk some about the connection between the Japanese print collection at the Art Institute and Frank Lloyd Wright, who uh, was a dealer in Japanese prints among his many other undertakings in his complicated life. So without further ado, I will welcome Janice to the podium. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak here today. And thank you, Scott, for that uh, introduction. I feel very welcomed here at the Speed, uh, especially because there is a special exhibition on works of art uh, lent from the Princeton University Art Museum. So I feel, you know, very at home seeing Nassau Hall up there on the third floor. So that was great to see. And I've been at the Art Institute for over 20 years. I can't believe it um, myself. And in that time, I've researched the history and the formation of our world-renowned Japanese print collection. Um, built by many who came before me. And I've also had the privilege of adding to that myself with key acquisitions. And today I'm going to highlight different moments and various prints in the Art Institute, some of which will be very familiar, overly familiar <laughs> to you, and other examples which may be new to you and will hopefully be pretty interesting. Uh, Japanese prints as a category is extremely diverse, and we try to collect and present them all, selectively, selectively. And first, I'll be focusing primarily on uh, the early 20th century, uh, when our collection was initially formed, late 19th century, early 20th century, I should say, focusing on Clarence Buckingham, who is responsible for creating the core of the collection of Japanese prints that we have in Chicago. And the art dealers and advisors who were instrumental to him, including Frank Lloyd Wright. And then I'll talk about the pivotal period of the 1950s and 60s. And I'll end with highlights of the last several years in terms of acquisitions and uh, exhibitions. In my title is the term ukiyo-e. Uh, which translates to pictures of the floating world. It's an umbrella term for Japanese prints up to modern times that you probably have heard. And I'll describe what the floating world is more later. But first, here is the Clarence Buckingham collection of um, Japanese prints at the Art Institute. This collection is probably the second biggest draw for the public to the museum as a whole after the Impressionist masterpieces. So I'm pretty glad to have that number two slot. Um, here's the gallery where we do the print exhibitions. And we do those exhibitions uh, one per quarter. So we do four per year. The prints are up for three months at a time. When I started at the museum, I was told that I had the hardest job of any curator. <laughs> Since the collection is so high profile and so often changed, it is not something that I feel is, is a burden. If I have the hardest job, well then great. Um, but to my knowledge, this is the only gallery space within a US museum that is permanently dedicated to the display of Japanese prints. And this is something that was provided for in Clarence's sister Kate's will of 1937. She was the one who gave her brother's collection to the museum. 
Currently, there are about 16,000 Japanese prints in our collection, depends how you count, but around 16,000. And these consist mostly of works from the pre-modern period, the Edo period, which is roughly 17th to 19th centuries. But there's also a sizable collection of modern and contemporary prints. And there's also about 3,000 woodblock printed books, which are getting a lot of attention lately, which I'm happy to talk about later on or even give an entire lecture on. <laughs> so not nearly all of these prints came from Clarence Buckingham, but it was his collection that formed the basis of it and made the Art Institute a place for Japanese prints, both by attracting donors and by being a center for the scholarship and display of them. And if you go on our website, you'll find the vast majority of these prints searchable and viewable, thanks to a recent three-year-long initiative to enrich our online database. And with such extensive holdings, it's relatively easy for me to conceive of print rotations every three months in this space on a specific artist or a specific period, a type of print, recent gifts to the museum, how a woodblock print is made. I mean, you name it, we've done it. If you have any ideas, though, let me know because I'm always looking for new ideas. And other than its size uh, and its comprehensive nature, the collection is strong in areas that would be very difficult to build up today. And that is the 17th and early 18th century works, the very beginning of these pictures of the floating world of ukiyo-e. Uh, as well as kabuki actor prints, and works of all periods that exist in their only copy in Chicago. Prints, of course, are, are multiples by their very nature. They're, they're prints, right? But uh, in Chicago, we have a few um, single, single copies uh, of works that exist, and I'll point those out as I go through. The condition of the collection overall is also relatively excellent, which is why we get many requests to show prints in exhibitions in Japan and abroad. So first, I'd like to briefly discuss the museum's founding and early history in order to put the formation of the collection of Japanese prints into better perspective. The Art Institute of Chicago was built as a conference center for the World's Columbian Exposition, or the Chicago World's Fair, of 1893. Shortly after the fair, the building became a museum, as it was originally intended. <coughs> the museum itself was born out of the fair, but another seed that the fair firmly planted in people's minds was the love of Japanese art. It was during the World's Fair that many prominent Chicagoans had their first exposure to Japanese art through exhibits sponsored by the Japanese government. And the most impactful of these was the famous Phoenix Pavilion, the Ho'oden, which was located in a coveted spot on the Wooded Island, as it's called, which is a tiny spit of land in the a lagoon in Jackson Park. And you can go visit the area today. The Phoenix Hall no longer stands. That's a story in and of itself. Um, but the astounding features of the Phoenix Pavilion were many. First of all, it was an unpainted wooden building constructed with traditional Japanese methods. And because of its seeming humility, it really stood out against the grand white Beaux-Arts structures that made up the rest of the fair. I love this image on the left, and you could make out the Phoenix Pavilion in the front, and in the background you have the more recognizable buildings of the uh, Chicago World's Fair, so you can see how much it really differed from those. And the uh, exterior is meant to evoke uh, the Phoenix uh, Hall in Japan, it's a temple from the 11th century just outside of Kyoto. Maybe some of you have been there, yes. But it really is just the exterior that was used as a model. The interior, as you can see, is broken up into three different spaces. The interior uh, was kind of a, uh, a large kind of period room for Japanese art, where you have three different periods of Japanese art in each of the three areas which looks nothing like the interior of this Phoenix Hall from the 11th century in, in Japan. 
So it's remarkable that, that this exhibit showed Japanese art, hanging scrolls, sliding doors, in context as part of decorated period rooms. You have uh, the hanging scrolls in a tokonoma alcove, which you would find in a Japanese, here we are, interior. <laughs> Uh, and as I said, you have three eras of Japanese art that were in three parts of the building, and all of the furnishings and artwork were created by faculty and students from the Tokyo School of Fine Arts. Um, and some of them are absolutely extraordinary. Uh, many of them no longer exist. Uh, those that do are mostly in Tokyo. Anything that could be picked up and moved back was, was um, sent back to Tokyo. But these transom panels here that were in the middle, uh, middle room, uh, those, those are in Chicago. And we have them on permanent view now. And they're multicolored. And they show phoenix. It's a phoenix pavilion. They show phoenixes flying among polonia trees. Um, so those are fantastic. We were able to conserve and restore those and, and put them on view. Again, uh, that story would, would take up an entire hour. But what I wanted to show you here are the three uh, different period rooms and what they look like. I love the mannequin. Really gives you a sense of <laughs> what, things, what things would have been like. So while this may not have shown Americans how to display Japanese art in their own homes, it did make the items more understandable and more desirable and introduce visitors to a variety of Japanese artwork. In addition to the Phoenix Pavilion, Japan had spacious exhibitions throughout the fair in several locations. The Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building was packed full of ceramics, metalwork, cloisonne, and paintings. A bazaar on the midway included a tea house, which I'm showing you here, and a Japanese music hall. The Japanese tea house became a very popular attraction where visitors could sample different kinds of green tea. A contemporary Japanese printed book commemorated the displays for those in Japan who were not able to get to Chicago to see the fair. The 1893 World's Fair was the one event that was the most significant in educating a popular American audience on Japanese art. The expense to which the Japanese government went in order to build the exhibits was not in vain. After this, Clarence Buckingham embarked on a lifelong passion for collecting Japanese prints. Another famous name, the young architect Frank Lloyd Wright, would also be forever changed. And these two men were instrumental in bringing Japanese prints to the Art Institute and the public in Chicago. The most significant addition to the Art Institute's collection of Japanese art was Clarence Buckingham's collection of prints. He purchased his first prints only one year after the fair in 1894. And we don't know why he chose to focus on collecting prints, but it was a really savvy decision for the time. And not only was connoisseurship advanced enough for Buckingham to be able to rely on knowledgeable advisors and scholars, but Japanese prints were also relatively cheap, plentiful enough, uh, to create a strong collection of just the best works on the market. And we understand from uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's letters that Clarence Buckingham was very, um, very discerning, almost too discerning <laughs> for Frank Lloyd Wright's liking. Um, Clarence Buckingham's focus on Japanese prints may have come out of an interest in old master prints. He had a very fine collection of works by Durer and Rembrandt but also contemporary works by the likes of Whistler. And it was known that he loved to hold print parties at his home. Buckingham was a successful businessman and railroad magnate. He was on the board of several banks. He served briefly as the president of the Northwestern Elevated Railroad Company, and he was trustee of the museum for over a decade. So I often like to think, what could Buckingham have thought about the images of beautiful people, courtesans, the amusements of life in, pre -modern, in a pre-modern Japanese city, such as the scene of pleasure boating on the Sumida River in Edo, which is now Tokyo, when he first embarked on collecting Japanese prints. Japanese prints of the floating world 
which are termed uh, ukiyo-e, literally pictures of the floating world, trace their origins to a specific set of sociological circumstances. Perhaps the foremost factor was the lifestyle that emerged in Japan's capital following the Great Fire of 1657, in which thousands of Tokyo residents perished and about three quarters of the city uh, was destroyed. Uh, the city, of course, made up of mostly wooden buildings. So uh, it was a fire and it just spread very rapidly. Just a few years later in 1665, one writer described the floating world as this kind of concept, this idea, this phenomenon, as living only for the moment, turning our full attention to the pleasures of the moon, the snow, the cherry blossoms, and the maples, singing songs, drinking wine, and diverting ourselves just in floating, floating, caring not a whit for the poverty staring us in the face. So basically carpe diem, right? <laughs> Prince of women wearing elaborate kimono appealed to the townsmen's sense of fashion and style. Kabuki actors and their hedonistic existence were exciting. Courtesans played a significant role in a society that worshiped them as fashion icons, choosing not to focus on the servitude. The printed image was a convenient way to give people what they wanted. I mean, this is really the first time in Japanese art that people could see themselves in, in these images. I mean, they were absolutely revolutionary. And it was commercially viable to produce images that you know, these, these townsmen would, would want to acquire because they represented the life that they had or the life that they wanted. A large audience developed and ukiyo-e flourished and retained its appeal for almost 200 years. This was a foreign world for Buckingham to navigate, but he had help. In his collecting of prints, Buckingham's best ally and advisor was Frederick Gukin, the Art Institute's first curator of Japanese art. Gukin was one of the foremost scholars of Japanese prints in the US, who despite not reading Japanese, strove to learn all he could about the world that produced these images. Gukin met Clarence Buckingham at a bank where he was an employee, and without any formal education or financial means, he nurtured his love for Japanese art and began mounting exhibitions and lecturing on Japanese prints. He advised Clarence Buckingham for many years and collected himself. Although his primary obligation was to Clarence Buckingham, he worked on a freelance basis as an advisor to many other prominent collectors, such as the Spaldings in Boston, the Freer, uh, and, and to the Met. In the museum's archives, in our departmental archives, we have an unpublished manuscript by Gukin, a monograph on a designer of actor prints. So remarkable about Gukin, there are many remarkable things, uh, but remarkable is his cataloging. And here I'm showing you an image of one of his notebooks in which he carefully copied all of the writing that was on a print. Remember, he didn't read Japanese. He's copying the writing as an artist would. He, is, he was a very accomplished artist. And here he meticulously captured the calligraphic style of the writing on the print the signature of the artist and the artist's seals. Um, he was also known to copy Japanese prints, the, the imagery, so carefully that they could easily be taken for the real thing at first glance. And I have seen these <laughs> because I've seen his estate. And you know, when, you, when you walk into storage, you see them on the table, like, oh, what Japanese print is this? You get a little bit closer, you see that it's something that, that Frederick Gukin painted himself. And um, actually, right now, on my desk in my office are a set of paper dolls that came to me from uh, the person who inherited Frederick Gukin's estate. And these are beautifully colored with these very intricate outfits. And they're basically paper dolls that you could change the outfits. And they were created by Frederick Gukin in 1915. And these are people from, figures from all periods. You know, Spain, circa 1570, there's one envelope <laughs> like that, you know, and uh, England, you know, circa 1610. And uh, he created all of these, and they're beautifully done, and he created them for himself. 
not, not for his daughter, which is also very interesting. So anyway, I have a, a box of that on my desk right now. And these are the things that you get in the mail, I guess, when you're a curator. <laughs> one, of, one of the many strange things. I have to figure out what to do with them. I might give them to the library. Um, so one of the uh, great strengths of the Clarence Buckingham collection and now the Art Institute is its group of prints that used to be termed primitives, works printed with black ink only using a single block. These are the earliest commercial prints that were produced in the late 17th century. And that term uh, primitives covers a nearly 100 year period before the widespread use of color printing came about in the 1760s. So as you can imagine, many well-known print designers emerged in this period, as well as uh, other in innovations that took place in printing. Uh, and many of the images are just with this black key block that you see, just that black outline. Some of them have hand coloring done to various degrees. I find it fascinating to look at the, just the prints in our collection, some of which are hand colored in a very cursory way where they miss all the lines. <laughs> they just meant to have color added just for the sake of having bright color. Other, uh, other prints are colored in by hand very, very carefully as if they were done by a professional. That in itself, the hand coloring on early Japanese prints, fascinating topic if anyone wants to get into that. Um, but for me, it, it's a period that charts the birth of Edo or Tokyo as the center of this, uh, these images of the floating world and the center of the publishing industry. Relatively few prints from this period remain when compared to works from the 18th or 19th centuries. Notable among these early works in the collection are those um, by the Kaigetsudo school. I'm showing you one here. Kaigetsudo, the name of the school, it means yearning for the moon studio. Studio of those yearning for the moon, very poetic. Uh, these are artists who produce bold calligraphic images of women on a spare background who are wearing elaborately patterned kimono. It's safer to say sometimes the kimono is wearing them because the kimono is more important pretty much than the woman. These are exceptionally rare. This work is printed, as I said, with just that one key block. And it was bought by Clarence Buckingham in 1897. It is one of just a handful impressions of this image that exists worldwide. And I've written on the School of Artists. Uh, I find it to be a fascinating bridge from a period when you have the floating world depicted in paintings to then the floating world depicted in prints. And this was a rare school of artists that actually did both paintings and prints. And so we can um, compare them because in this period, as you can imagine, prints were, were basically mimicking paintings. They were emulating paintings, the large size, the subject matter. Prints had not yet come into their own, right? So um, I find it a particularly interesting period. And we have some good examples uh, from this early period of ukiyo-e prints. Clarence Buckingham's association with the architect and visionary, Frank Lloyd Wright, seems to date from the time that the architect returned from his first trip to Japan in 1905. Wright went there to study architecture, and he returned with a large selection of woodblock prints, which you could very easily do at that time, many of which he intended to sell. And most of these he put on display at the Art Institute in 1906 which was the first public museum exhibition on Japanese prints. And unfortunately, I'd love to show you a picture of that exhibition. We have no photographs from that first 1906 show. This is something that Frank Lloyd Wright himself complained about, and he made sure that never happened again. Because in 1908, the next time that he did an exhibition, we have plenty of photographs of every aspect, even, even you know, the. Uh, the plant stands and the radiators. I mean, we have pictures of everything. Um, and so that's what I'm showing you here is uh, images from that 1908 show. 
In 1908, Frederick Gukin curated an exhibition of 655 Japanese prints from local collections, including Clarence Buckingham and the Art Institute of Chicago. And for this astoundingly large exhibition, Gukin wrote the catalog and Frank Lloyd Wright designed the massive show. Wright was actually the biggest lender to the exhibition and he designed the galleries and their furnishings to harmonize with the prints. Gukin, the curator, organized the exhibition by artist, but Wright arranged the prints within each group for maximum decorative effect. He used a limited color scheme, installing the prints in neutral mats with chestnut frames against walls covered with grayish pink paper. You're gonna to have to use your imaginations because obviously the images are just black and white. By hanging the works from green cords, uh, which you can see there, uh, of varying lengths, Wright created a simplified arrangement of horizontals and verticals reminiscent of the, geogra the geometric balance that he admired in Japanese art and architecture, and you can see in his own work. And what I really love is that he designed everything down to these plant stands in his own style. Those plant stands are incredible. People often ask me, well, where do they exist? Are they in the museum? Are they in storage? Where are the frames that were used in this show? Don't you still have them? No, we don't have anything. But one of the plant stands is in a private collection in Chicago, and I was able to borrow it for an exhibition that we did of um, prints that are now in the Art Institute that came from Frank Lloyd Wright as, as the dealer. Um, bought by, by Clarence Buckingham, who gave them to the museum. And I was really glad to include that, that plant stand. I mean, it's, it was uh, quite a lot to negotiate, just that, that one loan, but I was really glad to be able to do that. In early 1911, Clarence Buckingham bought his first prints from Frank Lloyd Wright, who was by now a dealer in Japanese art. He continued to purchase works from the architect for the next several years, including these beautiful landscape prints. These are fantastic impressions of Hiroshige's landmark series, 100 Views of Edo. They're very famous images, and they exist in multiple copies, but they're very hard to find in early, pristine states. And these are, if not the earliest state, very early impressions of the designs. I love using these for teaching and putting them side by side with impressions that are not as pristine, not as early, and ask students, so which ones do you prefer? I get a whole variety of, of answers. Um, there are prints that were done when the wood blocks had uh, worn down to such a degree, you can't even see the black outlines in the image anymore. And in order to make up for that, the printers bumped up the colors and made the colors um, brighter than ever. And so the students usually go for those prints saying, oh, this is the one that I prefer, <laughs> even though they're the latest impression. These are early, very early impressions. Um, and you see this really beautiful use of what's called uh, bokashi or gradation. In the way that the color is laid down, you see the dark blue fading to the lighter blue. You see, um, the dark gray here fading to the lighter gray. And there are many instances in the water here of this kind of gradation that you see on the prints. And that's something that can only be done by a master printer. It's not something that's carved into the wood like, a, like an outline or uh, an artist's signature. This is something that is unique to each print, the way that this gradation is painted um, freehand onto the blocks. And when you have a print that has multiple areas of that gradation, you know it's a special print. Indeed, uh, many of these, um, there are many other ways of telling an, an early impression. Um, the crispness of the, of the lines, making sure that none of the outlines have, have any breaks in them. And sometimes these um, title areas will, will have beautiful gradation and multiple colors in them as well. And then one really easy way to tell an early impression, if you can, turn the print over. Look at the back. 
and then you'll see just how um, how much of an impression the the wood blocks have have made on the um, on on the on the paper, and you see some of the color coming through. So that's also a very good way to tell. And now when you go to uh, any print shell, you're going to be turning those, those prints over. <laughs> well, if, if you're, if you're at, at, in a gallery you know, with, a, with a dealer, they would very much welcome that. Um, so wh where was I? Oh, um, Buckingham's total acquisition from Wright included over 300 prints, which we now have at the Art Institute. And this is a significant number to be sure. But remember, it represented only a small number of prints that passed through Buckingham's hands. Clarence Buckingham was continuously buying and selling. And at the time of the acquisition of his collection by the Art Institute in 1925, uh, we have, like I said, those 300 prints he bought from Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, they were added to uh, a larger group of about 1,500 that form the core of our current collection. Conversely, Clarence Buckingham was not one of Frank Lloyd Wright's best clients. Frank Lloyd Wright is believed to have bought or sold about 20,000 Japanese prints in his lifetime. Absolutely incredible. So I wanted to show you this very well-known image <laughs> because it's kind of, um, in terms of, of Buckingham's uh, collecting, it, it doesn't really, at the time, I don't think he quite realized the, the fame that this image was really going, the sustained fame that this image was going to have. He purchased this great wave uh, in that I'm showing you in the middle in 1905. And it was the first of three impressions to enter the museum. The next one in 1928, I'm showing you on the left. And then the last one, which came into the museum in 1952. I love displaying these all together in the gallery because people walk into the gallery and say, well, why are there three great waves and which one's original, right? Well, you all know that they're all original if they're done with the original wood blocks, whether they were done during the artist's lifetime or later, if they're done with the original blocks, then you can call them original. I mean, they're prints, and so they're done in multiples. And somebody with a lot more knowledge than me, um, who is a conservation scientist, uh, Capuchin Kornberg, at the British Museum, she has just done a remarkable study of the Great Wave, uh, all of the existing copies that are in museum collections, and determined that there are eight different editions of the Great Wave that you can kind of line up and say, well, this is the early edition, this is the middle, this is the late. So there are eight different editions, and our prints are numbers, and I hope I get this right. This is the fourth edition, this is the sixth edition, and this is the eighth edition. Uh, all, all done with the original block, and anything later, she, she didn't even count. You know, all, all the other copies uh, that exist. You can do about 10,000 impressions of an image before the blocks are basically unusable. And we can imagine that about 10,000 images of the Great Wave were created because it's so perennially popular. Um, I love comparing these because uh, I hope you can see, uh, the coloring's a little bit off on the slides, but I hope you can see the one on the right has a pink sky. See those pink clouds in the sky? That's something you don't often see when you look at the Great Wave. That's because the color pink that was used, it's a um, safflower-based dye called uh, Benny that tends to fade uh, with exposure to light and fades very easily. So that pink sky, while it's present on many other copies, including the two that I'm showing you here, you vaguely see an outline, right, of where that pink sky was, even on this one. Um, it's, uh, the pink has faded to this kind of yellowy color, and that's what's, what's left. Um, and also remember that gradation I was telling you about, that bokashi, well you see here, it just reaches just above the black, bokashi reaches just uh, above the tip of Mount Fuji. And believe me, there are people who can tell you how early an impression was made by how high up that gradation goes on, on Mount Fuji. Okay, I mean, I'm not that kind of person, but yes, they can do that. 
Um, but look at here. They've totally gone off script, right? So here the, the bokashi, that gradation, is, is diagonal, right? So they just wanted to kind of jazz up the image a little bit. It's the printer who, more than the artist, it's the, it's the, it's the publisher who dictated what the different editions would be, um, how large the print run was, what special materials were used, how much ink, how much deluxe uh, of an edition you're going to do, because they had to um, reap a profit on, um, on the print run. So it was really the publisher who made many of these artistic decisions rather than the artist, which is something that's interesting, I think, to keep in mind. Um, also, you'll notice that back here, getting a little technical now, you see that break up there in the wave? That is such a famous break, everybody. All the connoisseurs talk about that. If you have that break, it's like, uh, well, we know the print was done you know, at a certain time. Uh, after the 1830s. These, this one has the break. This one does not, right? So, so this is definitely pretty early. Um, so anyway, it's fascinating to compare all of these, and I love getting them out in storage for, um, for our members or for students and looking at them really, really carefully. Just fascinating. Uh, the Great Wave, as you can imagine, is one of the most popular prints on our website as well. Uh, it was great one day a few years ago when our uh, head of strategy, I think was his title, wrote me a very excited email and he said, oh, the great wave, oh my god, it's, it's the fourth most clicked on image on our website. It is you know, so popular, it's right after American Gothic and, and Nighthawks. The great wave, my goodness, so many people are interested. I said, yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised. So that, that kind of set off, you know, a whole kind of PR campaign where we've got blog posts about our great waves. We, uh, I did, a, I did a, a member lecture that's on YouTube. I'm almost up to 40,000 views. Pretty happy about that one. Um, I'm surprised by the popularity my, myself. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really nice when, when you can say, yes, you know, the Japanese art collection. We're, we're within an encyclopedic museum, but yes, the Japanese art collection does get a lot of attention, you know? So I just, I just love that. Um, here we go. So following Clarence's death in 1913, his sister Kate put the prints on loan at the museum and set up Gukin as the curator. And for the next 11 years, she continued to purchase prints in her brother's name, never with her name on the credit line, always with her brother's name on the credit line. And she added some of the most famous works in the collection and provided for their exhibition and their care. And what I'm showing you here is an extremely rare, uh, one-of-a-kind um, print. It's not the only image that exists, but it is uh, the very first edition uh, of this series. Uh, in the middle, I'm showing you one of eight parlor views by uh, the artist Harunobu. These eight views are based on eight poetic landscape views uh, that come from Chinese ink painting. And this particular view is called Descending Geese. And can anyone spot what could be the stand-in for the Descending Geese? Well, I'll tell you, it's the bridges on the, on the koto, on the string instrument that are sort of in this V shape. Those are, those are the descending geese. So there's like a lot of parody and, um, you know, what's called in Japanese uh, mitate, these like word game, visual um, games going on in this series. Uh, and it was done uh, not commercially when it was first produced. It was done only for people in a, a particular circle, poetry circle. They got together and wrote poetries together. Um, and it's not the artist's name that's here. It's, it's the uh, producer. It's the member of the poetry circle who put up the money to have these eight images created. And uh, on one of the, the eight, the signature is not carved into the woodblock and then printed. It's written by hand. And so we know that this set was the very first impressions made of this famous series because it's as if 
the, the publisher had just finished printing the, the set and showed them to uh, Kyosen, the producer, and said, what do you think of these? Are these up to standard? And Kyosen said, by, by signing his name on this, said, yes, these are all good. You can go ahead and make some more for all of my friends. Uh, later on, the images were produced uh, in much greater numbers and, and, and produced commercially, um, but this, this is the, the very first set. The color, this, this is 1766. This is basically, you can say, two years after the um, introduction of full color printing in, in Japanese prints, and already the, the coloring is absolutely pristine. Uh, so it's just amazing to me. Uh, and Kate also um, was able to um, have a great success by adding to her brother's collection a group of 34 works by the artist Sharaku, and I'm showing you one of those on the end. And this is an artist who she did not uh, favor, apparently, but she was advised that this was a pretty great opportunity, so you should probably you know, be able to scoop up these prints while you can. This is an artist who was quite an enigma for a very long time, kind of came out of nowhere in 1794, had a 10-month period of activity where he produced an enormous number of prints of actors, these uh, bust portraits being the most famous, and then 10 months later kind of vanished from the records and stopped producing prints again. So um, really fascinating, kind of one of a kind, the, this is an image of uh, an actor playing a female role in kabuki. Women did not perform on the kabuki stage. Men played the female roles. And instead of showing this actor like a beautiful woman, the uh, artist uh, has chosen to create quite a caricature with this big nose and you know, looks kind of uh, masculine there you know, in, in, in his kimono. Uh, we, we know it's a man because also he has his cap over the bald spot. And men at this time were re required to shave the pates of their, of their head. And they wore a silk cap that was dyed dark purple to sort of match the color of their black hair when they were on stage in order to create the illusion of, of being women with a, with a full head of hair. And uh, Sharaku, however, shatters the illusion by showing them in such a masculine way that they could never be mistaken for, for graceful, graceful women. Um, but the background of this print is a, a dark silvery gray, and, and it glistens. And that silver is done with mica powder. Mica is a mineral that, when it is um, made, into, um, made into a powder, into a dust, uh, you can adhere it to prints with a layer of glue. And so these prints, when you see them, it looks as if there's kind of a mirror background, a, a sil dark gray silver background. And that background, it, 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 with any wrinkling of the paper, the mica falls off. So to have that in pristine condition is very rare. These, these prints by this artist are so few and so rare that when a large exhibition of this artist is mounted in Japan, they come to us to borrow prints because there are so few that um, exist um, in Japan. Uh, and we, you know, <laughs> as long as they don't ask too often, we happily lend them. And uh, we, in return, uh, have our works in their catalogs. And the scholarship that's done is, is incredible. Uh, also, another kind of work by that same artist, Sharaku, um, I'm showing you here. These, are, these prints are much smaller. Uh, these prints are only about that tall, and they're very narrow. And this was a really interesting acquisition story. This is this one uh, on the left of the figure in the red checkered robe. Um, that print came up at auction right after I started at the museum in 2003. And one of our longtime volunteers and an amazing collector of Japanese prints himself George Mann, he realized that, wait a second, that kind of completes um, a set. We already have the two on the right in our collection. If we could just get the third one, we would complete the set. It's a triptych. They all go together. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's, there's only two copies of that one on the left that exist in the world. So we tried to keep this under wraps. It was an auction that was happening in Paris. 
And we tried to keep it under wraps so that nobody would quite, quite realize that, yeah, you know, we need this to complete you know, this, this triptych in our collection. Hopefully nobody figures that out and drives up the price. So thankfully they didn't. And uh, we were able to um, get the print on the left and put it together with those prints that we already have from Kate Buckingham on the right and create, uh, complete this, this set of uh, prints that show three uh, kabuki actors. Um, and what's interesting is that they were all in the collection of this one dealer in 1905, Hayashi Tadamasa. Uh, and they were, we have the auction catalog, and they were sold off as separate lots, and that's when they became scattered. And so two of them ended up in Chicago, and one of them um, you know, was elsewhere. And so we're, we were able to bring them together again uh, after almost exactly 100 years. Uh, so that was pretty wonderful, and we were pretty pleased with ourselves. We still are. It's the only place where you can see, you know, this complete triptych. Um, but of course, you know, we welcome scholars, uh, specifically Japanese print scholars, kabuki scholars, and one of them told us, yeah, well, you know, originally the set had five. <laughs> because it is uh, one of these performances called kao mise, which means showing of the face. And it's the kickoff for the kabuki season that happens in November. And that's when five actors come out on stage at a time, you know, to kind of show their face. And that's, there's only three, but there would have been five. But the other two images do not exist. You can't find them in any catalog or anywhere. They do not exist, so anyway. <laughs> Uh, I think it's a, it's a pretty fun story, and, and we display them quite often. Their uh, conditions were, were completely different, though, as you can imagine, having lived different lives. The one on the left was pretty well preserved. Uh, the ones on the right were, the paper was so thin that if you put them all together, they look like um, the paper looked completely different colors, and so we had to put uh, tinted paper behind the two uh, on the right in order to display them all together. That's the fun part of being, you know, behind the scenes. Um, okay, so moving on to the 1950s, uh, Oliver Statler was a major figure in the collection's formation, adding the next chapter, 20th century prints. He was among a handful of Americans who lectured and organized exhibitions of contemporary Japanese prints during the occupation after World War II. He was an army, army employee. And here we see Statler with the artist Uchima Anse in his studio and viewing an exhibition with the artist Saito Kiyoshi. Statler also acted as a dealer. Uh, he received no commission, though, for Japanese artists by selling their works to the Art Institute and to private collectors, specifically in Chicago. He had a specific link with Chicago, having been born in Illinois and having attended the University of Chicago. Through his personal association with the artist, Statler accumulated the most comprehensive collection of modern Japanese prints in the world. In 1951, the museum bought its first prints from Statler and its first works of contemporary Japanese art, and he also gifted over 200 prints and print magazines. Visitors to the museum who were used to seeing prints of the floating world, such as actor prints, beauties, and landscapes, were suddenly confronted with moody subject matter and abstraction in a sequence of shows featuring contemporary Japanese prints in the 1950s. And for these exhibitions, Statler worked with Margaret Gentles, who was the assistant curator at the time. The 1960s were really a watershed, ye watershed years in which Oliver um, Statler's connection to the Art Institute was solidified. This was when the museum mounted an exhibition of these 20th century prints, they're called sosakuhanga, or creative prints, because they are conceived and carved and printed all by the artist, Un unlike uh, traditional Japanese prints where um, each segment of the production of the prints is divided up among different skilled uh, workers. So this is an exhibition of uh, those sosakuhanga, the creative print artists, the catalog of which was done by Statler, and we know the majority of works were lent by him, but also by Mr. and Mrs. Albert Ehrenberg and other Chicago area private collectors. Featuring uh, work by Onchi Koshiro, the master of abstraction, 
Uh, in his memoirs, Statler recounted a story in which he and the Ehrenbergs visited the artist Onchi Koshiro in Japan. And Mr. Ehrenberg promptly bought 16 prints from the artist, including many abstract works, which the artist was absolutely thrilled about because these abstract works were getting no attention in Japan. People didn't know what to do with them. They didn't understand them. But here you have these Americans you know, buying them all up. And even though Onchi, the artist, was very happy uh, with this, he was also a little worried because he created at most 10 uh, impressions of each design, uh, and so often fewer than that. And so he's like, "Well, these are these are all all the prints that you know that I've made, and they're getting bought up here." Um, also, uh, we have a, a great collection of works by this pivotal artist Onchi Koshiro. I like to do exhibitions based on them pretty often, and here I'm showing you one that has this portrait of the artist friend. Um, uh, severely kind of wrinkled, mottled face um, brought on by depression from, uh, uh, from the war. And uh, it's, oops, it's a very, very well-known image um, that we have all the, all the steps in the creation of. So here you can see on the wall, first the face is the color is printed and then you know the eyes and the, you know so there's you know a whole sequence and uh, at the art institute we have the sequence which was created in order to teach onchi students how to print the image and and so it's unique to our collection uh, we have many works from artists directly in recent years uh, here i'm showing you an acquisition of contemporary woodblock prints a uh, set uh, of five, I'm only showing you two, by Yoshida Ayomi. It's all from a series called Touches, which range in date from the late 1980s to the early 1990s. And Ayomi comes from the well-known Yoshida family, who had several generations of print artists and who are well represented in our collection. As the latest Yoshida artist to gain international fame, her work is distinguished from her predecessors in that it has a more conceptual basis. And it goes to the core of what it means to make a print. Um, a print is a way to make multiple images. And so her work focuses on process and repetition. This series is based on photographs of the Kanda River, uh, which flows by her home. And it features bright colors in place of the color that the water would actually be. She did this so viewers would focus first on the repetition of the small gouges that she makes in the woodblock with her carving tool, and later on what the image represents. She has given generously from her family's collection works by her father, her grandfather, uh, which we display in the galleries from time to time. Her mother, her, her grandmother, they were um, very successful women artists at a time when there were so few of them, and we're going to be doing an exhibition of the women from the Yoshida family and other women artists, uh, Japanese print artists post-war in the spring next year, so I hope you can see that. And continuing uh, the major shows featuring works by contemporary artists in 2020, we had an exhibition entitled Noda, My Life in Print, which was up for two weeks before the gallery went dark with the pandemic. <laughs> Thankfully, we were able to extend the show by several months so that people could get a chance to see it. And it featured prints from 1968 to 2013 that span the length of Noda Tetsuya's long career. He's perhaps one of the most diverse print artists in terms of subject matter. On view were portraits, landscapes, still lives. The one thing they have in common is that they are all personal and meaningful to the artist himself. These prints are created uh, from the artist's everyday life. He takes photographs as he goes about his day, and he feeds those photographs into a 1960s um, mimeograph machine, creating a stencil uh, from which to print the basic image, and then he overlays color on those images using wood blocks. And so the images have this kind of photographic quality. And what I'm showing you here are portraits. He does a lot of portraits of his family. You can't be a family member of Noda's without having your whole life documented in prints and shown to the whole world. 
And these are, and I've met his daughter. Uh, <laughs> and this is her when uh, at very ages, various ages from 1978 to 1981, going off to school. And I wrote a blog post on these images during the pandemic because I was home with my own daughter watching her you know, grow up and you know, staring at her every day. So I kind of felt a real kinship with these images that are basically frozen in time. Um, and Noda is a lovely man, very sentimental. Um, and I was able to also do a, a virtual talk with the artist and his wife um, also during the pandemic, which was wonderful. So, um, of course, Chicago has a lot more than uh, just Japanese prints in terms of Japanese art. Uh, we have a contemporary ceramics show coming up in December. Uh, all by women artists, which I hope uh, you can make the trip up to see. I've been really fortunate to be at the center, uh, at a center for Japanese art and care for the collection, as well as display and loan it often. Uh, we have great partners throughout the US and in Japan for its study. We welcome a lot of, of scholars and, and curators. Um, there are so many people who uh, care, who are responsible for the care and development of the collection over the years. I can only highlight a few of them, but I'm really glad that our exhibitions have kept step with the times and are able to welcome a global audience. And I hope to welcome many of you to, to Chicago to see it for yourselves. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Do we have any questions? Yeah, Bob, here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a very fascinating lecture about this. I do have a question. As we know that printing actually was invented in China in the 8th century, and at that time, the Chinese influence on Japan was strikingly strong in architecture, calligraphy, uh, and, and landscape painting. But I know that in Chinese art history, yeah. printmaking, artistic printmaking was not a major art form. What is it about the Japanese, uh, the Japanese culture that really encouraged printmaking? Uh, I know they also did uh, landscape painting and calligraphy it was very, very important, but what was it that, uh, that influenced yeah. the Japanese to do more uh, uh, printmaking, like you said. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that wonderful question. You're absolutely right. And printmaking and color printmaking existed in, in China. There are uh, a few examples. It didn't really take off like it did in Japan. And so my answer to that question would be, it's, it's the commercial atmosphere um, in Japan. It's the, it's the, um, it's the kind of uh, prosperity of the um, common person, the, the townsperson, wanting to spend just a little bit of money on something beautiful, something that reflects them and their way of life, and something they could uh, put up in their home. And um, there was, you know, such a boom in pre-modern commerce in in Japan uh, under shogunal rule in the Edo period. Um, that it created a, a population of people who were very sophisticated, urban dwellers, who were very literate, who um, frequented publishers' shops to buy books and prints and printed images, and it's this publishing industry that really took off. So it's really just the, the uh, commercial nature um, of uh, the Japanese, basically in other cities, but primarily in, in Edo, in Tokyo, um, that created the market for these prints that differs um, from China. Great question, thank you. Thank you. Any estimation on prints lost during wartime? Thank you. So many, so, so many lost in the many fires that took place in pre-modern Japan. And then, of course, there was the earthquake of 1923 um, in Tokyo, where um, we have a much better idea of exactly what was lost. Um, there were uh, publishers who uh, basically cataloged you know, everything that, that was lost. And so vast, vast number. These are 
ephemeral works on paper. Um, it's interesting that the most ephemeral Japanese prints uh, are fans, uh, actual paper fans that people use, and because they were, they were used as fans. They were cut out and they were pasted on bamboo sticks and they were actually used. And then you also uh, get pillar prints, which are long and narrow, and they were used to paste onto pillars in, in homes. So once you stick it on, you can't get it off. Um, you can't preserve it. So uh, it's not only the, the disasters, but it's also the, the use of Japanese prints, uh, which led to many of them being destroyed, which is why it's all the more incredible when you do have a fan print, or you do have uh, a print that is kind of uh, intermediary in the process. It's not a finished print. It's, let's say, a print that only has the black outlines that was meant to have the color, but it didn't quite get there. Or it's an artist's sketch. Artist's sketches were destroyed in the creation of, um, of, the of that woodblock. They were used to carve through in order to create the outlines for that key block. And so you don't get artist's sketches, except for the ones that do survive. So. Um, thousands upon thousands. Thank you. Oh. Have time for a couple more. Can you say a little bit more about the, the dyes and inks that they use, particularly in the pre-20th century works? Yeah, um, so most of them are, are well, they're going to be natural dyes, uh, natural sources, plant sources, um, mineral pigments don't work very well on prints because they tend to be uh, very thick, uh, so they would flake off you know, if the print were folded or wrinkled. Um, so they tend to be plant dyes. Indigo is a very popular one, which you, which you actu actually have to ferment in order to get the blue color from the plant. Uh, others like safflower, uh, which is a yellow um, flower, you... Um, uh, you, you have to put it in a special da uh, bath, like an alkaline bath, in order to get that brilliant red color, that pinkish red. And then, you know, you, you have, um, there's also vermilion. Um, there's, uh, later on, there's cochineal for red as well. There's matter, which um, produces a red. So there are, are a lot of um, studies that uh, are done on pigments. And they're really fascinating, especially because we have the ability to scientifically take samples of those, of those colors now on the prints and determine exactly what they were. Uh, so there are many studies that are coming out as to what exactly the original natural dyes were and then when uh, the chemical dyes were introduced, such as the Berlin blue and the magenta and the, um, the bright reds and the bright purples that you get uh, towards the, um, the very late 19th century. When were they introduced and how were they introduced? And there's a lot of experimentation going on. And a lot of the research has been done by Henry Smith in Columbia and the um, conservation scientists at the Met. Um, so it's really, really fascinating subject of research. One more. Um, I've got two questions. Sure. Um, the first, the earliest curator, Gherkin? Gukin. Gukin. Uh, how did he become such an expert in the area when he didn't speak Japanese and he had to copy all these things so diligently? So who helped him with this process and how did that happen? And secondly, mm -hmm. is there any move on the Japanese government to bring back, repatriate, some of these collections that were purchased in such huge quantities. Mm -hmm. So uh, Gukin was, uh, he was in a really fortunate position that he had the Clarence Buckingham collection and so he could learn from the prints themselves. And then of course he had advisors in people who had been to Japan, um, people who were Japanese scholars who uh, helped him a great deal, whose names, you know, are not prominent enough. Um, he does thank uh, one gentleman in that unpublished manuscript, and unfortunately I'm, I'm forgetting the name, but he does um, thank one Japanese scholar in that for, for helping him with some of the sources. Um, but also people who had been in Japan, like Fenaloza, 
uh, or people who had been uh, collectors for long periods of time, like the Spaldings. It seemed like there was a very close network of uh, Japanese specialists. And uh, he was, um, he, could, he could lecture for a lifetime just based on the Clarence Buckingham collection, especially because uh, a lot of the pr prints that Clarence Buckingham had, they, they just didn't exist anywhere else. And so he kind of had the primary materials right, right there. Um, and they were very discerning. Um, when you read about the, um, the different approach that Gukin and Buckingham took towards Japanese prints, as opposed to Frank Lloyd Wright, who was interested in their colors and how the size harmonized with a particular pillar that he was creating in a home. You know, he wasn't really interested in, in, the, in the history of them as uh, Gukin and, and Buckingham were. And, and there was a lot of scholarship out of, out of Europe as well, because Europe was earlier to the game uh, from the 1860s. And then, of course, Boston earlier as well into the 1870s and 80s. So by the time you get to the 1890s, certainly 1900, there really is a lot of scholarship on, on Japanese prints already. Um, and then your next question about the repatriation. So Japan's really interesting in that it has um, a, a very solid set of um, cultural property laws that uh, came into effect around the 1910s or so. So anything that is designated an important um, cultural property or national treasure is on, that, is on that list, and anything that is not is able to leave the country you know, today with an export permit from the Japanese government. So uh, everything is so well documented that there, were, there really is no, um, there would be no, no basis for the Japanese government to say, well, this was done without our knowledge. Um, so that's kind of the short answer <laughs> to, to your question. And also um, another aspect is that Japanese prints were not considered high art. I mean, they're not Buddhist sculptures. You know, they're not, they're not even, they're not screen paintings. They're not even hanging scroll paintings. They're these things that, that were not really even considered fine art. Um, uh, for the longest, un until basically, you know, modern times. So, uh, again, they, they're really not something that would be designated um, an important cultural property for the Japanese government to want to repatriate. Um, but, the Jap but the Japanese are definitely wanting to buy back prints. So whenever there is an auction, a private collection that has been held for 70, 80 years comes on the market, uh, you, you better believe that, you know, the Japanese private collectors and museums are there trying to um, buy back as much as they can. Thank you so much, Janice. You're welcome. Thank you for making the journey and, and sharing your expertise with us. For those of you that uh, haven't visited our latest exhibition that just opened last week, Stories Retold, American Art from the Princeton University Art Museum, I encourage you to visit on the third floor of this building. Thank you all. <laughs>